pushing ahead with the agenda. And next we have Dr. Charlie Barul, who came to us from Washington, D.C., Children's National. And he's going to talk to us about devices, devices, devices. All right. Thanks, everybody. And I uh, want to add my, my thank you to the SADS folks and the Texas Children's folks for inviting me here and having a nice full audience of family. Uh, it's a lot different than when we're doing the, the virtual Zoom SADS webinars and you have no idea if there's two people or 200 people on the other end of the, of the webinar till, till you're done. Yeah, I'm from Washington, D.C. and that uh, picture on the left of the, the Capitol in the background where all your crazy congressmen and senators uh, work uh, is walking distance from my hospital, Children's National. Uh, and we, we're not gonna talk politics, but advocacy, it's important that you can uh, advocate for people with SADS conditions and think about how much funding they get from the government. It's, uh, it's way too little. If you talk about diseases like cystic fibrosis, uh, which is much rarer than SADS, they get about 25 times the funding that SADS conditions get from Congress. So uh, advocate for your conditions to your congressmen and senators when they're done uh, running for office. Uh, so we know that most devices aren't designed for children. And here's just a few examples of patients. There's one, the little tiny preemie in the top with a temporary pacemaker that's actually bigger than the baby. Uh, the, the infant there with a sternotomy to place a pacemaker. And my cute little patient who I took care of in Washington is now cared for here, here in Houston by Dr. Miyake. Uh, the little ballerina there, you can see actually on the side, on the side view better, that pacemaker there in her belly that the parents put the arrow on is just too big for a little ballerina's belly. Uh, and so we, we're trying, to, we're gonna to talk today about uh, devices and focusing on uh, devices for children. And at the end, if you don't like seeing blood and guts, I'm going to show uh, a, a couple of videos at the end. They're piglets, they're not babies. But if you don't like to see hearts in motion, you can just turn away. Uh, or if you had bacon, then maybe you don't want to see the piglets either. Uh, <laughs> so, first device we're going to talk about are loop recorders, loops and recorders. So, we're going to talk about loop recorders. Uh, and they've gotten a lot smaller. So all of the manufacturers have really downsized from what used to be the, um, the size of like a pack of gum. Uh, that's what we used to say, that it, it's about the size of a pack of gum for the Reveal XT. And now all of them are essentially injectable and, uh, and, and quite small. Uh, and th that has led to more uptake, meaning it's, uh, we're using them in more patients to make the diagnosis and figure out what the rhythm is without having anything in or on the heart. And there's been studies showing that these are useful in pediatrics. We can demonstrate either the heart rate going too fast or too slow and figure out then what the more accurate treatment is. Does the patient need a pacemaker? Does the patient need a defibrillator? Does the patient need medications? Uh, and several, um, several different programs have shown the utility. So these are pediatric patients so that uh, had devices. I don't expect people to be interpreting the electrograms, but showing different types of tachycardias and bradycardias in, in children with devices. So these are, these are useful diagnostic tools if you can't figure out what's going on from the outside. Typically we'll use external monitoring, Holter monitors, patch monitors, things like that um, before putting in an injectable monitor, but they are, they are quite useful. And then pacemakers is the next size up. So in children, the standard way right now to put pacemakers in is either transvenously through the vein, the way that most adults get their pacemakers, or epicardially in the smaller children where we think the veins might be too small or they have uh, concomitant congenital heart disease. The uh, surgeon has to open the chest like you saw in that first picture and sew the wires onto the heart and in those cases the pacemaker typically ends up in the belly. Uh, and so those are the sort of standard ways. You can see in the transvenous picture we make a big loop to uh, hopefully allow that lead to grow as the, as the patient triples their size in the first year of age, which is different than when an adult gets a pacemaker and they're not still, still growing and defibrillators. So ICDs have come a long way. This is a, a, a plaque I got from a company and an x-ray of a child who got a defibrillator. It's a 10-year-old with long QT syndrome who uh, ended up uh, drowning. And nowadays we know from Dr. Ackerman and from others that 
swimming is a risk factor that uh, is um, one of the ways that patients with long QT syndrome present. So she was 10 years old, had a cardiac arrest, went to the bottom of the pool, got resuscitated, fortunately did great, and I put a defibrillator in, in her in 1994. At that point, she was the smallest patient in the country to get a defibrillator. Nowadays, we're putting them in, in you know, babies if they need them, uh, but defibrillators have come a long way in the past 30 years. And I showed this slide yesterday in the, in the uh, conference for the providers. And ironically, this young woman who's now uh, in her 40s uh, is, uh, has outlived the company. That company, Teletronics, has gone out of business. So. <laughs> And now we even have guidelines and, and expert consensus recommendations for many of the people in this room uh, have come up with guidelines for who should get a device if they have uh, an inherited arrhythmia. So we're going to talk about what's new that's good for specific, specifically for pediatrics because devices have gotten a little bit smaller over the past three decades, but compared to the size of an infant, they're still pretty big. And miniaturization is feasible, but there's not much of a market incentive for it. For people who are in the business world out here, it's hard to justify to a for-profit stockholder company to make a product that might be useful for 50 kids a year. It just doesn't do it for their shareholders. Uh, and children because they're smaller, require less defibrillation energy. So for a defibrillator, you could potentially make a smaller device that, that packs less energy. And you know the old days of batteries and capacitors were pretty clunky. And so that technology is improving and the size of the devices has progressively gotten smaller over the past three decades. But again, they're, they're great for uh, teenagers and, and adults in terms of that, that decreasing size. But if you're a five-year-old, it's still pretty big. And the biggest problem with devices, in my opinion, is the leads. The leads break. So uh, this chain link fence, you pull on it, it as a kid grows, the, that lead is not designed to be there for 80 years, right? We, we're happy if a lead lasts 20 years, but if you're putting a lead in an eight-year-old, you are going to end up having to replace that multiple times over hopefully the next 80, 90 years of life. And as difficult it is to put in, they're even harder to take out because as you can imagine, they scar into place. And so we end up doing what's called lead extraction where we pull on the lead uh, and, uh, uh, and we pull out sometimes pieces of tissue of the heart as we're pulling out the lead. So that's, that's probably one of the riskiest things we do uh, in our field is lead extraction. And so just like Bryn said about uh, going to get your care and your diagnosis and your therapy, probably even more important for getting an expert to, uh, if you're getting a device uh, and particularly taking out the device because it's risk versus risk. Uh, you, we either have to abandon the lead in place and just leave a whole bunch of old leads as sort of uh, uh, space junk in there as we put, put in the new ones or extracting the lead, taking them out and not leaving those old leads in place. The, so that's, that's how we have to balance that that risk. And so I think the goal is really to avoid putting leads in the veins. And so some of the newer technologies that are coming around over the next few years and are here already are ideas and, and concepts and devices that don't have leads in the veins, which is the way we've been putting, putting pacemakers and defibrillators in for now 40, 50 years. So we think that the next generation devices are, are all going to be uh, not through the vein. So sometimes in our field, we have to be creative. We have to do non-standard things. We can't just take what's off the shelf and stuff it into a six-year-old and hope it works. So we have to use pacemakers that, uh, that are there, and then we can use some of the technology and make it better. One of the most exciting things that's come around for, uh, for adults is leadless pacemakers. So as I said, the lead is the most vulnerable part of the system and the most problematic part in terms of taking it out. And so companies hear us and they've come out with leadless pacemakers that go in through the, the vein in your leg, the femoral vein, and go up like a catheter procedure and basically leave this lead on the inside of the heart. Again, uh, I'll show you a picture of it. The, those are those are some of the, the some of the uh, leadless pacemakers. There, they're quite small, uh, and they get embedded in the inside of the heart like a little bullet. Here's a 
a diagram of what it looks like, a little docking mechanism from the catheter that goes in. There's a little uh, screw on the end of it or, or some little tines that, hold, that sort of grasp it into place like that. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see on the x-ray where it sits on the heart there, uh, right there. <laughs> and, and there's no leads or wires. Uh, and there's another uh, manufacturer, probably the most commonly used one, and that's the one that's got the little tines that hook in uh, on, on there. Used in thousands and thousands of adults since this was introduced now uh, 2015 and 2016 for the two different uh, uh, products. So now you know, tens of thousands of adults have gotten these devices and here's our data in pediatrics. There's really not much. Uh, there's a few cases uh, here and there. Here's my, my partner, uh, Libby Sherwin, uh, put this one in an eight-year-old. So we've, we've done a handful of cases, I think less than 10, uh, somewhere between five and 10 cases uh, in, in uh, putting them in, in smaller children. There's a couple of case reports out there in the literature. I like this one. This is a, a case from Israel. They had a, a um, loop recorder in that showed this long pause. So you can see the heart rhythm sort of stops. There's no beat there for, for about seven or eight seconds. And so they realize the child need a pacemaker. And so they put the pacemaker in. What I like about this picture, this is the leadless pacemaker here. And on the skin, under the skin, that's the uh, loop recorder. So they're about the same size. One's just in the heart and the other one's under the skin. But on the x-ray, they look, they look exactly the same. Uh, and and uh, one of the um, pediatric electrophysiologists has been advocating for using this in really small children, uh, putting it in through the neck vein, the jugular vein, and putting it in from essentially from above. Uh, I don't think that this has been widely adopted. He's been doing this, and uh, I, I think it's, it's uh, novel and innovative. Uh, but what we have to worry about with putting these devices in children is how we can get them out, right? Because Again, if you put this in a 70-year-old and it lasts 10, 15 years, maybe you need a second one when they're 80, 85, and you can leave the first one in, put the second one in next to it. But in an eight-year-old, again, who might need pacing for 80, 90 more years, uh, and these devices last eight to 10 years, 12 if you're lucky, they're gonna get a lot of devices. And, you know, I don't think you can put six or eight devices inside the heart and just abandon them. But the, the anticipation is there will be tools and techniques to get them out. Right now, they're, they're sort of modified. Here we're in Texas, so I'll show you a lasso. Uh, so uh, there's, there's some different snares and ways to, to pull them out and, and grab them. Uh, but it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to get these out because the scar tissue grows around them. And it'll be hard to, to get them out. Uh, so that's leadless pacing. I want to show you another novel thing that uh, we and others have done, which is putting pacemakers in without x-ray. 99.9% .9 of patients get their pacemakers put in under x-ray, and that's okay. Uh, they don't, you don't use a lot of x-ray, and most of the time it's fine. When you're pregnant, it's probably not a great idea to get x-ray, and this person's probably further along that it doesn't matter because she's probably going to have the baby the day after this, but that, that's actually not the, that's a friend of mine. That's not the, the woman who got the pacemaker in the photo, but the, the pause is the patient who got the x-ray. It's a, a teenage girl, teenage pregnant girl, who had a long pause and fainted uh, and had congenital heart disease, and we didn't want to use uh, fluoroscopy, and so I'm going to show you uh, the way we do catheter ablation for is a different type of uh, procedure that we do. And using those tools and technologies, you can see the pacing lead going down using sort of mag what's called magnetic guidance. It's sort of like Waze or, or the GPS in your car. And you see the catheter moving through the heart without using x-ray or any, uh, any other radiation. Uh, and you can see that right now it's going up to the top of the heart, moving down and, and coming down to um, place it in the bottom uh, of the of the ventricle uh, where it can sit and be able to, to pace this woman. And again, being able to do this without, without using x-ray. Now, it, it was a, sort of a one-off to do it on this patient, but I think in the future, that's what we're gonna be doing. I think x-ray is gonna be obsolete. There's all kinds of other ways to image besides x-ray that are safer and aren't 
um, adding radiation, which is a risk, again, to people, especially if you have congenital heart disease and you're getting other kinds of, of exposure. You're getting CAT scans for one thing, you're getting x-rays, chest x-rays, you're getting post-op x-rays, you're getting x-rays for your pacemakers. So I, th I think eventually uh, th this will be the way that devices are put in in the future. And so then after, after she delivered, Okay, where we go. Uh, here's the x-ray of what it looked like. And you can see the x-ray uh, showing the, the pacemaker uh, and going through in the tip of the bottom of her heart. Now, subcutaneous defibrillators. This is not a new idea. Uh, so I, I thought of this now in 2000, so probably in the, in the 20th century. And two other groups over on the other side from two different countries. So three people in three different countries had this same idea to do subcutaneous defibrillators uh, and use them in children to avoid putting defibrillator leads in, uh, in the veins or having to put, put them on the outside of the heart. So uh, we came up with this idea, but we weren't smart enough to patent it. Uh, and so now there's, there's lots of different ways to put pacemakers and defibrillator leads on the heart, but this company was smart enough to patent it 15 years later, the subcutaneous implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So basically a, 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 an ICD that goes on the side with a wire that just comes under the skin uh, next to the sternum and runs along there, like you see in, in the picture behind me and on, and on both sides. Uh, and so the advantage is there's no wires in or on the heart, and it sort of acts like uh, like an AED, like an automatic external defibrillator. It's sort of like having pads on here and here. It has, a, has this coil here and the can here, and that acts the same as having an external defibrillator. It just happens to be under the skin rather than on top of the skin. And so it has lots of advantages. Again, also doesn't need x-ray and less strain on the lead. Uh, and if it breaks and you have to take it out, at least it's just right under the skin. You don't have to do a lead extraction like I showed you uh, earlier. These devices are still pretty big. This is a 10-year-old patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, weighs 32 kilos, that's about uh, uh, 68 pounds. So a pretty small uh, child. And you can see cosmetically, it's a bigger device than the transvenous devices that we, that we implant uh, uh, right now. And here's a picture of this guy was playing a video game with his brother, uh, complained of dizziness, loss of hearing, and chest pain. And what we see as the electrophysiologist is this is ventricular fibrillation. The subcutaneous ICD shocks him and uh, converts him out of, uh, out of the uh, dangerous rhythm. Uh, and he goes on to continue playing the video game. So the devices have gotten smaller. You have always first generation devices are big. You know, it's just like anything else. Your, your first computer was really big and now you know, you, you got really tiny computers. Uh, the first generation uh, subcutaneous ICD was big. So the second generation, which is where we are now, uh, is a little bit less thick, a little bit less heavy and lasts longer, lasts about seven years and has the remote monitoring that we use for, for other devices. So it, it is improved and a bit smaller and I, I would imagine that it'll continue to get a little bit smaller. And we have to do some customizing, like I showed you that picture with the scissors uh, here uh, in the, on the right side shows uh, where you had to bend it so that because the, the coil was too long to go up and down in this small heart. And in this child who has dextrocardia, meaning the heart's on the right side, they put the defibrillator on the right side. It's not just that the x-ray is reversed. And then there's some newer things coming out. I'm going to show you some, some newer devices. This is what's called a substernal uh, defibrillator. There's a little tool, a tunneling tool here that goes just under the sternum and the, the coil goes under the sternum there. And, uh, and then the device similar to the subcutaneous ICD goes on the side there. Uh, so that's another, uh, another uh, manufacturer's idea for, for a, uh, a, de a defibrillator that doesn't have a wire in the heart. This one was really exciting. Uh, I saw this thing called the string defibrillator, subcutaneous string defibrillator. I talked with the, with the inventors and the manufacturers and it just, it just goes under the skin, around your belly. It looks really great. It was presented at one of our uh, meetings, the Heart Rhythm Conference now uh, in 2017 is a late breaking exciting abstract because they put this in some patients um, and we haven't seen anything since and I've looked on the company's website it's still it's still where it is now so if it works 
it'll be great. But it's been five years since they presented it, uh, their first patients at Heart Rhythm. So I'm a little bit less enthusiastic that it's going to actually make it to um, the market. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some of the work that, that I've been doing over the past decade on miniaturization of pacemakers. And our goal is to put them in without having to open the chest or put wires in or on the heart. So these are little piglets. These are about three kilograms, so seven pounds, cute little piglets. It's, you can tell they're not humans because they get eight nipples. And, uh, and there's, a, there's, a little, there's a little port there with two holes and one hole, a, a camera, a microscopic or thoroscopic camera goes down there so you can see what you're doing, which, is, which adds safety because you can see what you're doing at the other end because the other hole, a sharp needle is going to go down to allow us to put a wire in. So for those of you who don't like to see moving parts, I'm going to show you a video next. And so this is what it looks like from the inside. So that little needle goes through the port. The, ca the camera is what we're seeing it with and goes into what's called the pericardial sac. I see a couple of people looking away, it's okay. Uh, and so the needle goes into the pericardial sac right next to the heart and we put a little soft wire in and around the heart. And the nice part about being able to see it is you can avoid anything um, like, you know, not, we don't want to damage anything. So then a, a plastic sheath goes in over the wire, the needle's out and it's just a plastic sheath in there now. And we can put a defibrillator lead and wrap it around the heart. And by just rotating it, we fixate the defibrillator lead to the heart, pull out the sheath through that little port, and that's the end of the procedure. And you can see just a little small hole in the pericardium, which is fine. You don't even need a pericardium. You can take the whole thing out, but it's just a little hole in the pericardium, and this whole procedure takes less than an hour. Uh, and so that's one way of putting it in. And you still need to have a device, so that lead would be attached to whatever manufacturer's device there is, whether a pacemaker or a defibrillator that would go in the belly. And our next step is to design a lead that actually goes through that port so you don't even need to use a, uh, 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 an incision. And here, this, this is one of those prototypes of a pacemaker. It looks like one of those leadless pacemakers because it is. It's one of those leadless pacemakers that we put a cap on it and a little tiny, what we call a leadlet, which is about this long, that has a uh, corkscrew on the end. And the corkscrew goes through that port that you just saw, screws onto the heart, and that's it. That's the whole pacemaker in the back. It just goes in under here. And uh, it's been done now for probably 50 piglets. So if you have a piglet that needs a pacemaker, I'm the guy to do it. Uh, we haven't done it in any patients yet, but we've been to the FDA twice now, and, um, and we've been given approval to do it in five newborn patients who will need it. So we haven't, we haven't done it yet, but uh, the FDA and the National Institute of Health have, have given us approval based on the benchtop and animal work to do it. So probably 2023, maybe, maybe a year from now, uh, we'll, we'll uh, have our first patient, but it will be very selective in, you know, newborns or uh, tiny patients who really would would uh, be at higher risk of getting a standard uh, pacemaker. And then finally, our next step, which we've just started, uh, and my team has just started, is rather than that port that I showed you, which is small enough, the port's sort of the size of your finger or something, it's, it's pretty small. We're trying to do it completely injectable. So just a needle, get rid of the whole port, because the port was really to, to show you the camera so that we could see what we were seeing. And so here it's really tiny and the, the camera actually goes through the needle. This is unpublished, so you all are really the first ones to see this. Uh, and again, I'm gonna show you a little video, so I turned away. <laughs> uh, and so this is, this is, you're looking through the needle. This is the size of a needle. You're looking through the needle at the chest. That's the bevel of the needle there. There's the left lung and there's the heart, okay? And there's the heart, you can see a heart beating and the needle's going up to the heart carefully, carefully, carefully. And then we tent the pericardium, that little lining around the heart. And we push a little harder and eventually get into the pericardial space. And sorry, keep going. Okay, so there's into the pericardial space. And now you see the inside of the heart. You actually see the heart beating. Uh, and that little flap there is what's called the atrial appendage, the left atrial appendage. Uh, and we can 
put something on there. We, we again, we're, we're just, this is all new. And so that's our goal is to go from that scope that I showed you, we had much clearer picture through the bigger port and then a, a you know, a first uh, look at trying to get it through a needle. So uh, as the technology improves, I, I think it will become a reality because, you know, pediatric electrophysiologists, we have to be creative. The, the big companies aren't going to make us a pediatric pacemaker. It's just as I, as I alluded to earlier, there's no market incentive. They're all for-profit companies and, uh, and it's nothing against them. They're, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to make a profit. That's, that's their, their goal. It's great that they're, they're working with us to try to do this, but it's going to be um, organizations like SADS and the uh, Paces and Heart Rhythm and individual investigators to try to, to, try to do this. Now, so 50 years ago, we were watching TV on big devices like that. I can barely remember as a kid lo looking at a TV that looked like that at my, at my grandparents' house. And now you can watch TV on your phone, right? So miniaturization is feasible. That's, that's 50 years of, of improvement from that TV to your phone TV. It's pretty reasonable to expect that that, that defibrillator is from 1991, uh, so 30 years ago. It is pretty reasonable to imagine uh, that 30 years progress, maybe maybe in 35 years, we'll be able to be delivering these devices either through a port or even better through a needle. So I want to thank my team here uh, and uh, the support we receive from uh, philanthropic organizations and the federal government uh, and one of the device companies to to help us do that work. And happy to take any questions about pacemakers, loop recorders, defibrillators, or anything. <laughs> um, I had a question about the scar tissue on the outside of a defibrillator. It's my husband, he likes to lift weights. <laughs> yeah. And so his doctors told him, because sometimes he'll have like sharp shooting pains, but he's always said it's because of the, the scar tissue and, you know, manipulating that. And creating, does it create more when he's lifting weights or? Well, I, I'm not going to talk specifically about about you, but in, in general, uh, the more surgery you do, the the more scar tissue will be formed. And so bigger surgeries end up with more scar tissue. And everybody's different. Some people form a lot of scar tissue. When we go back in and, and reoperate, uh, sometimes we're, we're amazed to see calcified, what really hard scar tissue. And sometimes, even after 10 years, it looks smooth as can be. So there's, there's a lot of individual variation in, uh, in scar formation around the, the pocket of the device and around the, the leads. And so it's, it's somewhat unpredictable how much scar an individual is going to form. You sort of know some people are more prone to keloids and you'll see, you know, if they got pierced ears and they got a big lump there, that they're going to be scar formers, right? So you, you might know if individually whether you have more or less uh, scar formation, but uh, in general, it's, it's uh, the smaller, the less you do, the less scar hopefully will form. There's two in the back, one in the back and then right there. Um, that was a good question. Um, I'm not a person that keloids typically. I've had cesareans and everything else. But where my ICD is implanted, I have a keloid. Yeah. Um, is, is that normal? Uh, it's common. common. I don't know if it's normal, but it's common. We and, and there's lots of things we can try to do to reduce that risk, but it, it, they still... They still happen. Some people say that the vertical scar might be better than a, a diagonal or a horizontal scar, but I, I'm not convinced. I've seen keloids in everybody. Uh, I, I'm, I, I've been told by some patients that those that the creams that they pay a lot of money for, like um, I'm not advocating any specific brand. The only one I can think of is Mederma, uh, but a lot of people say that those help reduce keloid formation. So or or, or steroid creams. As I, I just tell my patients, wait till uh, it's fully you know, wait, wait a couple weeks before putting those on. But uh, they, they, some people tell me that those work. I, I, I'm not advocating for them because I, I don't know scientifically. So the new IED or ICDs you have, do they still record data and still transmit the smaller ones? Yes. 
okay. uh, they do everything that the that the standard uh, devices do yes it's interesting. two of the questions about scars are interesting because i tell my trainees make the scars look nice it doesn't matter whether it's you know a, a teenage cheerleader or 40 year old man and they make the scars look pretty because that's all your patients will see right they don't see all the hard work you're doing putting the lead into the uh, uh, some branch of the coronary sinus and the left ventricle to get technical they don't they don't care that that was the hardest part of the procedure the easiest part's closing it up but i always tell my trainees make it look good because that's the only thing the patients will see <laughs> and have to live with <laughs> <Thank>. <laughs> like him and they don't look wonderful but they're on both sides and all over the side yeah. then pretend it's a, a gang fight or like yeah. <laughs> when be, you be proud well, of you yeah so i've i've had i have uh i've had five units uh i have had the lead extraction and it blotted off what is it, the subclavian is that what it's called and uh so they had to move it over to the right side so uh i've had you know some experiences there but i did notice when you were talking uh, about some of these pacemakers and defibrillators, they're not combined, right? They, they are combined. So they are. All, all defibrillators have, these days, all defibrillators have pacing, pacemaker technology in them. So all defibrillators can pace, but all pacemakers don't defibrillate. So, so yes, all, all defibrillators now have all the, all the pacing capabilities in them. And your physician will decide whether you need one lead, two leads, three leads to pace, depending on which chambers uh, they want to pace or be, or be able to sense the rhythm from. And the battery of those compared to, okay, so the battery of the defibrillator and pacemaker compared to the pacemaker. Yeah, the main difference in, is that the reason the defibrillators are three and a half times as big as pacemakers is because they have to deliver a shock. And so you have to deliver what translates to about 750 volts. It's 40 joules, but it's, it's, it translates to about 750 volts. So you need a, a capacitor in there, a big battery, to be able to charge up and store that much energy. It's kind of like a Tesla. You have to store that energy in the battery to, to be able to, to defibrillate. And uh, a pacemaker just has to pace, so you're, you're only pacing at uh, two to five volts or seven volts at most. And so you can, you can use a much smaller battery to last the same roughly 10 years. I think they're, they're cluing me that the, no, nope, we're just no. Getting okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the back. Um, I'm on unit number one. Um, I'm 33 and, uh, defibrillator. I'm wondering if the technologies improve over time and it's, possible to get something smaller obviously that's a big expense but is that how easy is that to remove and replace the entire thing is that even going to happen in my lifetime that that sort of thing will be yeah i mean again i'm going to speak in general not about you specifically uh the the devices the batteries usually last give or take about 10 years. So maybe some might only last seven, some might last 13, but you're young or someone young that's your age, hypothetically, since I'm not talking about you, uh, will likely have multiple changes of their device, uh, hopefully, meaning you're going to hopefully live decades. And when the time comes to replace it, they can replace it with a smaller device. Uh, and uh, and that's usually the time. I, I don't... I, think it's pretty uncommon for people to electively replace it because this smaller device became available unless they're, they're having a lot of pain at the pocket so just, I wouldn't I wouldn't electively replace it just for a smaller uh, a smaller one I have a question. is it common that the devices heat up hmm uh, I, I wouldn't yeah it's not something that i'm commonly heard uh that, that you know that once they're in I, I don't think that they would typically heat up they they're metal so they they will um they they will conduct the, and store the heat just like your uh um 
you know, your, your container of coffee, if you put it in an aluminum container, that, that aluminum heats up. Uh, this is, they're made out of titanium, and so they will, they will draw in the heat, but, but I, I haven't heard that as uh, a concern or complaint from, from my patients or my piglets. <laughs> I've, had, I've had five five units and I pace about 95% of the time so I haven't, I haven't I've never felt heat. Have you, have you heard that? Yeah, so I don't I don't think that's a common sensation. You're in an yeah. MRI. Uh, an MRI, yeah. In an MRI, that's a good point, Dr. Miyake. If, it, if you're in an MRI unit, they can, they can heat up. But in general, uh, you're not living in an MRI, so... <laughs> we'll give you the final do question we, for do Dr. We, do we still have the same risk uh, for truffling if they truffle through the airports, for example, the, like uh, kids? Do you still have the same risk? Uh, that's a good question. So the question is the same, the same concerns about uh, uh, electromagnetic interference. Uh, so the, the pacemakers will, uh, will sometimes pace when they're, when they're in a high magnetic field. The defibrillators will turn off the ability to defibrillate it when they're in the presence of a magnet. And so it's okay to walk through those uh, metal detectors. We, uh, we advise that you don't put the handheld wands right on top of the device uh, so that if, if they don't let you walk through uh, to get a pat down rather than, than uh, put one of those wands over it. And don't stand with your, your arm, that if you have a defibrillator here or pacemaker, don't stand with your arm right over. Uh, that happens going through like store security. So if you're in the mall and they have those big towers, it's fine to walk through, but don't lean on it and just stand in the in the entryway of the store because people with uh some people have passed out from from that from their device turning off during during that not if you walk through but if you're standing and right next to your phone in the pocket a phone in the pocket yeah we we, we def most of the or all of the companies have have put in filters for your phone but we still advise not putting it in your breast left breast in the pocket uh where your where your device is most of the companies have have put in filters but like my phone this has a little metal tab i mean a little magnetic tab on it like that that's probably is too small of a magnet to make anything uh beep but anything magnetic you don't want to have within six inches of your device so if your device on the left side don't use this pocket to store a phone uh but th that's probably being over cautious because now all of the companies have uh cellular filters and it's more for magnets same thing with giant speakers so if you're at a rock concert your kids are at a rock concert uh that's fine don't let them be right up in the front row because they'll go deaf and uh and the speakers uh have the big speakers at at uh, concert venues are are magnetic okay. thanks very much thanks sure yeah. what's that do they have to leave no. Well, maybe before I start the fireside chat and continue uh, collectively, let's give a big round to Dr. Charlie Brule, Dr. Andrew Landstrom, and Bryn. That was great this morning.